Okay, well, this isn't a crisis, it's a correction. World growth is robust, and the economic fundamentals in the EU are strong. If only those words were true. But actually, uh, this is how EU finance ministers responded on the day that Northern Rock went bust on September 14, 2007. The time I was covering EU affairs for the Irish Times, and uh, I was in Porto at an informal meeting uh, with Charlie McCreevy was there, all the finance ministers. These sort of EU informals up to then had been pretty much backslapping affairs, you know, very informal, uh, chilled out. Everyone sort of did a bit of hobnobbing, uh, congratulated each other on how strong the European economy was. Um, the only sort of copy I could get in the paper was Charlie McCreevy, who used to rail against the pinkos who were trying to force you know, financial regulation on the markets. So little was I'd know that was going to be a very interesting day in uh, how Europe's economy was going to develop over the next few years. Now, you would have thought that at the site of the first bank run in modern Irish history that the EU finance ministers would have done something or said something dramatic. But uh, I looked at my article last night that I wrote at the time, and they said, ministers debated possible regulatory responses to the credit crunch, but there was a consensus that there should be no immediate regulatory response, and a period of reflection was necessary. Now, we're pretty dry in the Irish Times, uh, as that uh, comes across. Uh, but I think you know that sort of reflects the lack of action that's happened over the last four years. Um, finally, there seems to be some action from EU leaders uh, to this economic crisis that is really sweeping through Europe. Um, but I think it remains a real... Uh, I, th I think the fiscal compact that was agreed last week, or sort of agreed, uh, I don't think that's going to be the answer, to be honest. I think there's going to be more actions required. Um, I think also that the focus on austerity, which... Eurozone leaders, particularly Franco-German alliance, Germans in particular, are pushing on the peripheral states, it's probably not going to work. It could end up wrecking the EU, and certainly it could, as Tom mentioned, really have caused serious problems and damage to the Irish economy. Um, I mean, funnily enough, we are really the poster boy for austerity at the minute. Uh, in the Eurozone, everyone's congratulating us on how well we're doing and the fact that our economy came back uh, after three years of recession back into growth this year, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy recently said that we're almost out of the crisis. Um, and I think, you know, the economic growth that we've had this year demonstrates the resilience of Ireland's economy and its export sector. You know, we really do have a great economy here. Pharmaceutical, computer services, they're pretty defensive exports. And uh, even in a recession, you know, there's potential to grow them. Um, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that we're going to be able to you know, keep, continue growing next year. I mean, it, really it does. This, this export growth sets us apart from the Portuguese and the, the Greeks and the other pigs, really. You know? We have a dynamic multinational sector. You know, it is a strong economy, Ireland. But you know, I just think that the fact that you know, the rest of Europe's in crisis, there's been a minimalist response to... Uh, to the problems across Europe, that it's pretty much inevitable now we'll see a recession in Britain, probably spreading across the Eurozone states as well next year. And in that environment, it's really hard to see that Irish exports can continue growing and to you know, allow the Irish economy to get to the 2.5% economic growth that's required uh, to have the national debt peak at 118%. And whenever you get to that 120% level of GDP, it's really a risky area where people are going to question whether they want to have anything to do with funding your country. So uh, I think that's going to be the crisis that emerges next year. Towards the end of 2012, when we're looking to refinance, um, I think that's really going to be very, very difficult to do. It raises the prospect of potentially an emergency budget uh, halfway through the year, next year when it looks like we're not going to meet the EU IMF targets. Croke Park deal, as Tom says, that probably have to come back on the table. You saw Pat Rabbit hinting at that the other day. Um, and, you know, once Croke Park was back on the table, then you have the potential for social protests, um, which is the one thing that really 
Ireland hasn't had, which has been a real positive for the economy. International investors love a stable, conservative type economy, and, and we, we might lose that. Um, I'm going over a lot of the ground that Tom did, but really, you know, there is a need for debt relief. Michael Noonan says 15 to 20 billion is what they'd hope to get if we can get somewhere on the Anglo promissory notes. Uh, their forecast to cost about 47 billion over 10 years. It's a massive amount of money. The problem is that really nobody's listening in Europe at the minute. It's pretty much unsurprising because there are other bigger players at risk out there, the Italians, the Spanish. I mean, I've just joined the Financial Times and uh, it's very difficult to get my articles in the, the very prestigious Eurozone pages at the minute because basically everything's on the Italians and the Spanish and the Germans and the big players. So, you know, the focus just isn't on Ireland. No wonder Andy Kenny struggled to get anywhere with this idea of bringing debt relief to the table last week. Um, Fintan O'Toole was mentioned. He's a great column in the Irish Times today. Um, and, you know, Ar Irish referendums, the Europeans hate them because we tend to vote no and then vote yes, second time round. Uh, but it adds that whole instability thing into European politics. Germans really hate them, actually. Uh, but they are a bargaining chip, and it's going to be very interesting to see over the next three months how that develops. There is, you know, there's a, I, I think there, they probably should raise this. I'm sure they're raising it behind closed doors, talking about, you know, if you help us out with the bank debt, we'll try and do everything humanly possible not to have a referendum. Uh, I'm sure there's those sorts of discussions going on. My own f thinking is that probably there will end up being a referendum because that deal that they did is not going to be an EU deal. It's outside the EU structures. Uh, it's a new international agreement. That means... Um, Gavin Barrett was on television last night saying they can't use this article in the, uh, the Constitution, which allows, gives you greater leverage uh, on EU treaties. Um, and I think the political environment, you've had Fianna Foyle coming out today and saying they want a referendum or they think it should happen. That puts a lot of pressure on, on the government. So I think for those two reasons, there's more of a chance of a referendum happening. That could end up being positive for Ireland in that it certainly would add leverage to the whole bank uh, debt and debt relief issue. Um, it also raises real uh, pitfalls and challenges and uh, potential problems for Ireland because it's going to be very difficult to get a yes vote uh, at the minute in this current climate of austerity, especially if the economy even begins to tip even more over the edge early next year. So um, I think those are the main issues. I mean, the loss of Britain on this deal that was agreed last week, that's a pretty big blow for Ireland because they're a key ally in lots of areas. You know, during my time in Brussels, the whole justice, immigration, tax, financial services area, we'd be cozying up to uh, the Brits, basically, allowing them to do the running in EU negotiations and we'd fit in behind and quietly support them. Um, and, you know, the Brits are going to be, well, very much undermined, I think, in EU negotiations going forward now. Um, I mean, there is the bigger question about that EU agreement, and that is, you know, it might not even work for the rest of the Eurozone, and that could overtake all these sort of more parochial Irish debates. You know, the ECB, there's no real sense that it's going to really get out there and, and, you know, solve the debt crisis, as a lot of countries are calling for it to do. Um, and even when you go and look at the, you know, the, the financial services regulations and, and the changes they've been making there, you know, the European Banking Authority, is it really getting to grips with the banks across Europe? You know, these stress tests, they're on their fourth or fifth variations of them. And uh, there's a lot of political pressures in these organisations and they don't seem to be actually living up to the tasks that they're given. Um, and that's important because, you know, Ireland, uh, Ireland's debt actually wasn't too bad when it went into this crisis. Um, it was 25% of GDP coming into it, which is one of the lowest in the Eurozone. So Ireland's potent, you know, problem was really a banking crisis. And uh, you know, that, I'm not so sure that the new regulations that they're working on in Brussels will actually solve that because you're still going to have national regulation. Um, and true, this fiscal compact seems to be just on the austerity and the debt rather than addressing transfers between member states and, and the Eurozone in total. So I think there's a lot of weak links there. 
and uh, you could well see a big explosion sometime in the new year and then everything will be up for renegotiation, hopefully the Irish bank debt.